Hello, and welcome to another episode of Risky Business. Our whoops, I did start 63, it's uh, 64, my bad, but uh, yeah. Anyway, um, today is kind of exciting. Uh, the next one should be even more exciting than this one, but uh, let me go through the, the news. Some plans have changed since, uh, since the last episode. Uh, so let's uh, start with a recap here. Um, so this is the stuff we were thinking about last time. We were planning things out and thinking about, you know, what hardware, what other additional hardware are we going to get? We figured out we're going to get uh, SSD and uh, we're going to get uh, possibly either a USB card or an audio card. Uh, and we weren't sure on the specifics of those things yet. And we were planning for this episode to uh, uh, directly boot Fedora from the uh, Hi5 Unleashed, uh, put it on the first partition of the SD card and directly boot it. And then, you know, just try plugging things in to see what is... Uh, what the um, the bitstream of the FPGA supports for the expansion board, like if it uh, actually supports uh, USB ports and stuff like that. Uh, that was the plan, but uh, I needed, I still needed to get the uh, Fedora put on the first parti partition of the SD card. So before I was going to do that, I was going to look into, you know, just see if there were any significant updates in the world of uh, Linux, uh, Risk Five distro, uh, Linux distro developments, you know. And I looked up like the the Debian stuff and the Fedora stuff. Uh, so you know, if you just search like uh, Fedora Risk Five, so we have the uh, architecture is risk five page on the Fedora project wiki. And I took a look through there as you do. And, uh, or I guess, uh, maybe it's, they split it into a separate page. Um, the one for, yeah, so they split it into a separate page. The one for installing, I took a look there because, you know, we're going to put it on the SD card and I wanted to see, like, uh, the information about, like, instructions for that stuff. And I was looking at the High Five Unleashed Getting Started Guide 2 for information about that stuff. And so I was looking at this page and I noticed this here. Uh, install Fedora GNOME Desktop on Sci5 uh, High Five Unleashed plus Micro Semi High Five Unleashed Expansion Board. Detailed instructions are provided by Atish Patra from Western Digital Corporation. So big big shout outs to you, Atish Patra. I'm sure I'm butchering your name as I do everyone's name, but uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, but huge shout outs to this person because uh, this is uh, absolutely amazing what they have here. Uh, so they have this uh, repository here. Um, and I was looking through this. And uh, it's pretty exciting. But before I get into that, uh, I just want to take a little moment for an aside for. Um, discussions about news in the community before we get into the, the juicy, exciting stuff. So uh, let's cover the news first. Um, one bit of news is there's this um, this RISC-V chip for a couple bucks, apparently. And uh, I haven't taken too much time to look at this. I skimmed through the page about it. Um, it sounds like... Uh, they're gonna put a uh, like a revised version of this on crowd supply, but right now, 
it's like some Chinese um, uh, shop that you can get this stuff, this from right now. Uh, but like I say, they said in the comments something about that they're going to put it on uh, crowd supply or they're going to put a, a better a better one on crowd supply uh, at some point. But there's lots of good information in the comments and there were a lot of videos linked as you can see. Uh, and I haven't watched any of those yet, but uh, I'm going to look through those. Uh, so yeah, just something to check out. Another another piece of Risk Five hardware in the in the world. So that's always good news. And it sounds like this is a very uh, cheap piece of hardware too. And it uh, uh, has some built-in stuff for uh, uh, doing neural network type stuff. So that's interesting. Uh, then uh, that's all I'm going to say about that for now. Uh, we'll take a, a look at the crowd supply thing when when they do that, assuming that uh, comes to fruition. Uh, and uh, like I say, off stream, I'll take a look more, you know, more in depth to, uh, uh, of this here. But then uh, another thing. Oh yeah, and uh, it's been a while since uh, Robert Baruch. I don't know how you pronounce his name as as usual, <laughs> but. Uh, he, uh, it's been a while since he's done a update for the LM ARV, uh, his video series about uh, making a, a Risk V processor from discrete components, and uh, yeah, he posted a new one, and it was a great watch. Uh, he, I, I remember on Risky Business there was a a moment of confusion that I had about um, the fact that it's you know the byte is the uh, the smallest addressable unit, um, and he ran into the same confusion. <laughs> he was thinking it was going to be like 32-bit because you know working with the hardware of you know it, with like registers and things, you know, you're usually dealing with the you know the 32-bit words. And he overlooked the fact that in terms of memory access, it would need to be bytes, you know, by bytes, and uh, so his video was kind of going over that sort of thing, and that was a really interesting watch, so I recommend checking that out, and you know, like I said, checking out his series in general, it's a, it's a good watch. And uh, I haven't checked recently to see if the Kestrel computer thing, if uh, that guy's done any updates, I know he had been... Uh, silent for a while as well but he doesn't i'm not aware of him having any kind of social media presence and he has it on like a different site it's not youtube it's like a, a free and open source alternative to youtube i guess that he has his series on but uh yeah i don't know the status of that right now but uh there's another thing i should put this on the links.risky.tv uh this colin riley guy here uh he has an interesting uh, project here. He's doing a uh, designing a RISC-V CPU in VHDL, uh, and it, from what I understand, it was originally a um, uh, oh uh, risky five. Uh, if you're not aware, it's Kestrel. I think it's with an A. Um, it's uh, not an O, but uh, if you go to links.risky.tv. You'll see it, uh, or maybe it's an E. I'm not the best with pronouncing my vowels, so <laughs> I understand if uh, it's hard to make out the correct vowel for my. Uh, oh, Pure Tube doesn't like Pale Moon. But yeah, there's this thing. So it's on PeerTube rather than YouTube, and I'm not aware of the guy who's doing this if he has any social media presence, and uh, apparently he doesn't even have it up anymore. So I guess that series is gone now, apparently. I don't know. Maybe it's somewhere else. Uh, if someone can find it elsewhere, please point me to it, because uh, he was doing that, and that was interesting, but uh, maybe it's gone now. 
So if it's if it's gone for good, I'll take it off the links.risky.tv. But uh, yeah, it would be interesting to know what's going on there. If that's been abandoned or, or what, I don't know. But uh, yeah, so this I should probably put, it's, it's a blog series, not a video series. But uh, from what I understand, he started with a, a design that wasn't RISC-V based. Uh, and he updated it to be a RISC-V based uh, project um, in like part 15. And there is at least 16 parts as, as of right now. So that might be worth checking out if you're interested in that sort of thing. Uh, the other news, uh, not directly related to RISC-V, but um, semi-related, something that I would tie into RISC-V that I want to just mention here. Uh, there are two stories relatively recently. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, Domas. Again, don't know how to pronounce names, but uh, this guy. Uh, uh, I, I gave a short rant in the past about Sandsifter, about how it's kind of terrible that uh, x86 processors have like undocumented instructions and that was a talk that he gave about how he made this tool to like kind of fuzz those sorts of things and uh, discover these undocumented instructions and i tied it into you know i gave a little just a, a brief little rant saying to check that video out and how um tying it to risk five that you know this is kind of why i'm interested in risk five things like this where you know uh basically if you want to be super paranoid uh you can't trust your your hardware unless you you verify the actual hardware you're using that everything is as you expect it to be or if you you know you need to be able to trust if you don't verify your your actual hardware that you're working with you need to be able to trust you know, the entire supply chain that led up to it, you know, getting to you, right? You need to uh, have some implicit trust there. And, uh, you know, the first step to, you know, if you want to verify your hardware, uh, the first step in that is it needs to be open hardware <laughs> because if it's not, you know, you wouldn't be able to verify it, you know, as in like, I mean, like actually, you know, imaging, you know, getting like die images, taking die images of your physical processor, you know, and, you know, going through meticulously and making sure everything looks as it should, you know. Uh, if you don't know what it's supposed to look like to begin with, you know, you're kind of in a bad place and you're going to need to, uh, you know, if nothing else, you'd have to reverse engineer and figure out what it's doing. Uh, But kind of having open hardware is a, a huge first step in that direction, as well as giving you, um, even if you're not concerned about verifying that what you have is what you expect, if you're willing to have some level of trust there that what you're getting isn't compromised, uh, the other thing is, you know, having the choice as the consumer where you can go to a big person, you know, a big company that's producing chips that have stuff like maybe DRM extensions and whatever, and proprietary whatever. But then you can, you know, have the alternative to say, you know, let's go to a smaller company that's producing chips that don't have those sorts of things. And, you know, having open hardware, having something like RISC-V is lowering the barrier of entry and making it possible for those kinds of alternatives to exist at all. And that's a, a hugely important thing. And that's kind of why I'm, uh, interested in doing my series about risk five to kind of promote it that's why i'm interested in risk five is because of these sorts of considerations and so i was just kind of you know tying the sand sifter thing into that well now there's an update um to what this guy's been doing uh he did uh, another talk recently and uh he has this up on github but i watched the talk on youtube um 
you know, if you just search like x86 backdoor, I'm sure it'll be one of the first results along with the, the previous Sansifter talk. Um, x86 backdoor. Yeah, so breaking the x86 instruction set is the talk about Sansifter that I uh, recommended checking out in the past and talked about a little bit on the series. The new one is uh, God Mode Unlocked Hardware Backdoors in x86 CPUs. And uh, it turns out he found using the work he, you know, building from this previous work of like having Sansifter, he shows that uh, he found uh, x86 CPUs specifically uh, their via I think C3 or something like that CPUs. So it's not, you know, it's not like every, every, any and every x86 CPU. And it's not like it's the big names like AMD or Intel. You know, we're not talking about those uh, x86 processors. We're talking about like a, you know, via C3 chips, you know, specifically. Um, but he, he discovered that uh, those chips have. Uh, a backdoor that allows uh, privilege escalation, and in fact, uh, some uh, systems shipped with it enabled by default. So it's like a thing that uh, the operating system can uh, enable or disable. And then, if you're in, you know, user land, uh, you can't enable it if it's disabled. You need root access to to enable it. You know, it needs to be done from like machine mode or something. But uh, ring zero, you know in x86 terminology but uh if it's enabled then you can be in ring three or you know whatever the ring is that's the the user land uh uh privilege mode of the processor uh you can have code running that's untrusted that can uh uh use this backdoor to uh circumvent everything uh all the traditional you know security and um uh, get escalated privilege. It can get uh, root access by uh, using the um, the backdoor. Uh, it's a pretty interesting, some pretty interesting work, and uh, it's uh, it's interesting. You know, it's not like anyone's using these particular processors uh, for their you know desktops or anything. But uh, it's an interesting consideration, even if it's not really a problem in the wild, uh, which maybe it is for some people, I don't know, but <laughs> uh, it's an interesting consideration because um, it shows the fact that uh, it kind of shows that these kinds of uh, backdoors can exist. It confirms that, you know, these sorts of things can and have happened in the case of this, you know, chip here, it's actually happened that there are, you know, actual backdoors in some x86 CPUs. And then uh, it kind of shows how you can go about uh, finding that sort of thing and the tooling involved in uh, uh, uncovering that sort of thing and, uh, you know, all of that sort of considerations that go into, uh, you know, revealing issues like this and uh, trying to find issues like this, trying to find backdoors and, uh, you know, just being aware of the of the issue to begin with, right? Hello, Croefa. Thank you for uh, tuning in. So uh, this is a, you know, a talk that I highly recommend checking out. And uh, yeah, I guess that's all I'll say about that one. But, uh, you know, again, it just ties into RISC-V in that, uh, you know, this is why we need RISC-V, right? Because uh, with, you know, transparency and having open processors, you know, you can have kind of assurance that you're you're not dealing with a processor that has undocumented instructions that are potentially containing backdoors, you know? Uh, you know, which isn't to say that you can't make a RISC-V processor that has those things, but uh, like I say, the nice thing with something like RISC-V is that you know, you can lower the barrier to entry so that companies, you, you know, you can have the option as a consumer to go to a company that's making a chip that you know doesn't, you know, have that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, RISC-V is, a, is a, an important step in the right direction in regards to getting away from this kind of situation, right? Uh, the other thing 
is there was this article from Bloomberg, and this turns out to be fake news. So uh, this is not a real thing, but uh, uh, if you, in case you heard about it, there was this uh, article suggesting that uh, there was a, a, comp a, a compromise to the supply chain for uh, these uh, super micro servers where uh, uh, the idea was uh, the ch you know Chinese uh, government or something went in and uh, disguised these supposed little uh, chips as signal conditioner things and that they could uh, you know compromise and spy on the system or something like that and like I say uh, it turns out that this is fake news, and yeah, as Risky5 says, fake news from the dying Bloomberg times. So, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about this, but it does, it, you know, I thought I'd point it out because, you know, it does raise the question of, you know, you should be thinking about, can you really trust your supply chain? And, you know, theoretically, could an attack like this be done, you know? Uh, traditionally, we think a lot about, you know, attacks like backdoors on the CPU itself and, you know, stuff like the Intel management uh, engine thing or the AMD's platform security processor, you know, what's going on inside those. And then, like I say, even not, uh, not related to those, then you have stuff like what this guy showed here, which is a different thing entirely uh, that is a backdoor. You know, traditionally, you're thinking about concerns like that. Well you know, maybe you should be uh, concerned about uh, hardware off chip as well. You know, just uh, something to, to think about for the, the security community, I guess, you know, uh, it's a, it's an interesting uh, topic, uh, a discussion point, you know, even, uh, even though this is fake news, it's still an interesting uh, discussion point, I think, to uh, consider. And um, uh, yeah, so uh, this guy here, he uh, interestingly has a, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a series, but a, a site, I guess, a blog that he calls Risky Business as well, but uh, not Risky with a with a C, uh, Risky with a K. But uh, he uh, uh, did a did a piece here that um, one of the stories only named sources uh, warned the publication that its uh, central claim didn't make any sense prior to publication. So it kind of puts the, the nail in the coffin for that story that it's uh, it's fake news. Uh, Risky5 says, still strange that a repeatable news agency was so assertive this was real. Maybe there is more to it than we know. I don't know. You know, that's uh, an interesting point. But yeah, that's all I have to say about this uh, this story. I just thought I'd uh, you know go over the news and uh, say that yeah, uh, just you know be aware that this is fake news. But it's an interesting discussion point, and it kind of ties into Risk Five in that you know again uh, having open hardware, having more transparency in the industry uh, is a, you know a big step in the right direction to uh, try to avoid these kinds of uh, situations, you know, and I mean, uh, att an attack on the supply chain is kind of something that's uh, difficult to <laughs> difficult to avoid that sort of thing. Uh, how you would, uh, you know, other than you know transparency within the whole supply chain of how things are done, but uh, you know. Anyway, it's just it's just food for thought. It's a interesting discussion. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's get back to the juicy stuff here, the good stuff. So yeah, uh, this person here has done all the hard work for us basically of everything you need to know to get a system like this. So here's the, you know, the money shot, the really exciting image to, you know, get everyone excited here. This is the end result of... Uh, these steps that they've documented here and the stuff in this repository. Um, it is, as you can see here from the on the hardware on the left here, this is a Hi5 Unleashed connected to the uh, expansion board 
and they have the uh, graphics card. Uh, I believe it's the exact same card I got. It looks like it at least. And then I know it's the the same uh, type of graphics card, but I don't you know uh, I don't know if it's the exact same card or not. Uh, but it looks like it is just from eyeballing it. But uh, yeah, and uh, it's hooked up here, and you see it's uh, hooked up to a keyboard and uh, a monitor, and they've got a full uh, Fedora desktop going on it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I looked through this, and I decided we're going to give this a try rather than doing the directly booting Fedora on the SD card and poking around and seeing what the FPGA is uh, able to use in terms of hardware and then kind of going from there. Uh, we can kind of jump, thanks to this this work here by this person, we can jump straight to having a, a RISC-V uh, desktop uh, Fedora environment going. So that's the current plan. We're not going to go with the old plan. We're going to try to go straight to this. And uh, from there, uh, it'll be exciting to try to... Uh, gets software ported to do a stream from it. Once we've got a desktop going, I feel like I'm going to want to do a, a bit of a mad rush to try to get it to stream, you know, <laughs> try to stream from it as, as soon as possible. Uh, so that might be the, the future here. But so uh, the other day, uh, I looked through this, and uh, they list the hardware that they used. So, of course, I already have the Hi5 Unleashed, I already have the expansion board, uh, I already have the graphics card, and like I say, I, I went with the same model. So, uh, I believe I have the exact same card as them, just from, you know, looking at the picture. But anyway, uh, I've got the card. And so, they went with a USB card. Uh, so, I take it that the USB ports on the um, Hi5 Unleashed expansion board, the FPGA bitstream currently doesn't support them. So you would actually need to flash a new uh, a new bitstream to the FPGA uh, to to support these uh, USB ports. I take it. Uh, so they use a PCI card to get uh, USB. And uh, so yeah, I went ahead and I ordered a um, I ordered the the card that they used. They linked it conveniently. So I just uh, ordered it, and uh, I ordered a um, an M.2 SSD as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you'll see here, I tweeted about this. Um, let's go back to my work Twitter. So I found this repository, and uh, let's just open up the, the thread here. Uh, so I bought the um, the USB card they used, plus a 970 EVO 250 gigabytes M.2 SSD specifically. That's the, the SSD I grabbed, just because it was a relatively cheap SSD. It was one of the, the cheaper ones on uh, Amazon. I just went with Amazon because the the card, the USB card, was on Amazon, and I like to buy from Amazon anyway. Uh, I've got Amazon Prime, so I can get like free shipping, and uh, um, I also can get like rewards with credit cards. You know, get some cash back. So it tends to be a, a good way to go for me. And this one was like I don't know, like eighty seven bucks or something like that for the, the SSD, so I just went with that one. And uh, from there, I started, uh, uh, I built the Freedom U SDK on my uh, laptop. And uh, I, I built it on my laptop because uh, my laptop is where I have the, you know, it has the built-in SD card reader. Uh, <laughs> this message is brought to you by Amazon. Yeah, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not uh, sponsored by Amazon. Um, but uh, yeah, I uh, I use them. 
I'm not uh, recommending them. I'm not saying they're a good company or that you should uh, use them or whatever. I know there's been plenty of uh, stuff about like, uh, you know, uh, labor uh, mistreatment of workers and whatever. So I certainly understand if someone f doesn't feel morally comfortable using their, their you know, services or whatever. Uh, I'm not here to to say Amazon's a great company. I'm not uh, I'm not looking for a sponsorship or anything like that. <laughs> but I do use them personally. But anyway, um, so I have the uh, SD card reader built into my laptop. I don't have an SD card reader for my PC. So or you know my PC uh, and. Uh, I figured, uh, you know, rather than getting extra hardware for dealing with the SD card stuff, I just use my laptop, you know, save a little bit of money there. So I built the Freedom USDK on my laptop, and uh, I should also say, uh, I've mentioned in the past I switched to Cubes, uh, the Cubes operating system on my laptop. Since then I've switched back to Arch Linux. Uh, I never mentioned it because you know, it's pretty fast to install Arch Linux. It was just, you know, I just did that one day <laughs> and it's uh, it's back to Arch Linux now because uh, I wanted to be able to use screen share easily with my uh, girlfriend. So I just switched it back to Arch Linux. And um, so I keep that, unlike, unlike this system here, which I never, I never update uh, for various reasons. Uh, my laptop I do keep up to up to date and so it has a variety of packages which are newer than the ones the Freedom U SDK is meant to be built against because um, I believe they use U Ubuntu at uh, Sci5 internally and so you know that's not a, a rolling release distro like Arch Linux is and has older packages than you know the latest packages that Arch Linux has, so um, a number of things were were broken in trying to build the Freedom USDK. Um, I needed to uh, downgrade Python three, I believe, to like one one minor version back. I think it was like it was on 3.7 and I downgraded to 3.6, something like that. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's the 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 Gil or Guile. I don't know how you pronounce it. It's, the, it's like a scripting language or something. And that's been an issue for a long time. Like even with the Freedom ESDK, we ran into that of needing like an older version of that. Uh, and uh, rather than downgrading, I, uh, you know, the, you can easily find online how to like patch, patch stuff to to use the newer version. Uh, at this point in time, so I did some patching, and uh, ran into other issues. There were issues with uh, the newer glibc, and there were issues with uh, Python. Uh, one thing was uh, some stuff, I don't remember what it was exactly, something in like build root, uh, some package for that was, um, it, it had some Python scripts that it tried to run using Python 3 by default, and uh, it needed Python 2, so I manually went in and changed the make file to use Python 2 for that instead of Python 3. Um, and there was a lot of just kind of, uh, I tried to apply some patches that I found online and I wasn't getting them to apply cleanly. So I kind of gave up and just started, you know, looking at the compile errors and <laughs> going in and fixing things as I go. Um, and uh, a lot of it was just um, changing some, d you know, defines in headers and stuff and uh, adding like, some includes that, uh, like there was some stuff that sys uh, types.h uh, used to include in the older glibc, it used to include sys um, sys macros.h. Um, and I guess they took that out to reduce name pollution 
in the the more recent glibc so that no longer gets included and so i needed to go in and include that header in a variety of files to get stuff to build the worst the worst one was um I don't remember what the function was, but there's a function that something uses. I don't again. I don't remember what it was, but one of the one of the packages has a function that uh, the newer glibc uh, defines the function with the same name. And thanks to C not having proper you know namespacing, uh, you get a name collision. And so what I did is I just went in to the files that defined and used. Uh, the function with the the colliding name, and I just added an underscore in front of the name <laughs> for all of the the instances. I just uh, changed the name to have an underscore in front to avoid the the name collision, and uh, that got it to build. So <laughs> uh, that seems to be fine. And so you know, uh, with enough kind of tedious hackery and massaging things, I finally got the Freedom USDK to build on my laptop. And uh, from there, I continue to follow the steps in in this. And uh, so if you look through this here, what they have here is, um, so they tell you to um, clone this. So I did that to clone this. Uh, then you do this stuff to uh, get the Risk V PK stuff from the Risk V Linux project into your Freedom USDK, and uh, you recompile the the BBL thing, the Berkeley bootloader, um, and, and that all went fine. Uh, there were no issues with any of this stuff. It just uh, it just works fine once you've got a working Freedom USDK. Uh, you can do this nice and easily, and then. Uh, Uh, let's see here. So yeah, they have a um, a patch to a make file. Uh, you do that, and I think I just went in and manually changed the make file. I didn't try to, to try to even bother applying the patch. I just uh, went in and changed it. It's it's just a or no, I didn't even do this. This is to uh, to verify the the device tree. Um, and I didn't bother trying that, so uh, I just skipped this part. And then, um, yeah, you do this for the um, for the Risk Five Linux stuff, uh, the Linux repo from this. You you check it out in the um, the Freedom USDK, and then you need to copy the the Linux config from this to the the thing. And uh, I didn't change anything. By default, it uses the NVMe one. And uh, like I say, I, I got an NVMe SSD, so I don't think anything needs to be changed there. So uh, I think that all should be good. Uh, so I just followed the steps here. And then, uh, oh yeah, this is the, the diff they tell you to apply. And it's just a, it's just a, you know, you just change it to point to the the config. So I just went in and and did that manually. Uh, and then uh, you recompile the kernel, and that went fine. And then uh, I put that on my micro SD card. Uh, and like I say, that's why I did this on my laptop. And then. Uh, yeah, I downloaded the 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 latest uh, Fedora image, and I needed to install the tools for this um, this Gustfish thing, but uh, that's on the AUR on Arch Linux, so I was able to do that. It's not uh, called Gustfish. Gustfish is a tool of like a, a larger package. It's like libgustfs or something like that. Uh, but yeah, once you find that, you just uh, build all the, the tools you need for that. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of dependencies for AFA. <laughs> the, the, the Freedom USDK is pretty beefy. And uh, this stuff is, you know, it's 
all of this stuff is pretty pretty heavily in the territory of of dependency hell but uh you know that's what the the open source community seems to love so that's what everybody's doing right now and uh when we do tooling on our series we're going to you know trying to have some you know a tool chain that's not such a such a um bloated dependency hell that's kind of one of the goals of what I'm going to be doing is, you know, making some tools that aren't <laughs> aren't so much like this. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, you get this thing and you run this, and that gives you a naked ext4 file system. And uh, so then you just need to copy it to your um, your m.2 SSD. And at that point, I realized I'm going to need a way to connect my M.2 SSD. Uh, my laptop is, you know, it doesn't have an M.2 slot, and neither does my uh, PC. So I looked into what I could do, and I bought a uh, NVMe to USB adapter thing that I found. Uh, so I'm going to be using that to to do the. Uh, the writing of this image to the, the SSD. Uh, yeah, and once you've done that, you should be able to just, you know, hook things up and turn it on and uh, finish up the the setup process for Fedora. And you'll have a, a Fedora desktop that's uh, RISC-V based. So that's very, very exciting. And I'm at the point where all I need to do is uh, copy, you know, do this this DD to to write it to the SSD and we'll be be good to go there. So I just need the hardware at this point. And speaking of which, like I say, uh, I ordered it the other day, but uh, the 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 important pieces have already arrived. So they must have had like a warehouse in Minnesota that was stocked or something because it only took like a day <laughs> to ship it. Um, so we have here the USB card. And the 970 Evo uh, SSD. So now I just need the um, uh, the NVMe to USB adapter so that I can actually, you know, hook this thing up to my laptop and get this uh, uh, image written to it. So let's do a kind of a mini box opening here and just uh, open these uh, pieces of hardware up. And uh, that's going to be everything for now because, like I say, I need to wait for the um, the adapter. But uh, I think that's going to arrive on like Monday, so maybe we can do like a, a Tuesday high five stream again, a a, a, a risk five stream on Tuesday, and see. Hopefully, we'll see a um, a Fedora system. Uh, Risk Five Fedora system boot up for the the first time, and that'll be very exciting. So, that's something to look forward to. So let me just open this stuff up, and then I'll spend the rest of the time today, however much remaining time we have, I'll spend it on something else. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really planned for this episode of what we're going to be doing exactly other than going through this stuff, so. All right, and there you can see the SSD. It's a tiny little thing. And yeah, this just, uh, it slots in uh, under underneath the, the expansion board, basically.
But yeah, let me get on my uh, anti-static wristband and I'll try to show it on the webcam here. The other consideration is I don't have a capture card, so uh, it's not going to be too easy for me to show off the, the running system. I'll have to just uh, manually move my webcam around, and uh, I'll try to take some videos from my phone as well so people can see the system in action. And uh, But yeah, I think not having a capture card is going to be good motivation for us to um, port packages and try to get it to stream as fast as possible. <laughs> That's going to be really exciting to be able to stream from our RISC-V PC. So. That's kind of what I'm thinking the, the current goal is, to, to get that happening as soon as possible. Okay. So yeah, here is the SSD. It's just a tiny little board, thin as can be. And so it has like a little area to screw it in place on that side, and then it has a, uh, they call it like an M, an M key connector or something like that on that side. And yeah, like I say, this is just the uh, the 970 EVO NVMe M.2 SSD from Samsung. It's the, the 250 gigabyte one. And we don't really need 250 gigabytes, but uh, like I say, that was the, the cheapest one I, I found <laughs> on Amazon. So I just went with that. And it's very reasonably priced too, so I figured that was a good good way to go. Okay, now I'll get it. Uh, the I'll get the USB card uh, unpackaged. And uh, one thing I should say regarding the USB card, uh, I am thinking with regards to the plans uh, in the future. If um, someone else does, <laughs> if someone else does the work to uh, get uh, more more hardware stuff um, like the USB port specifically. Uh, if they get that uh, working with the FPGA, uh, we'll flash the bitstream, uh, the updated bitstream, and then we can uh, get rid of the USB card and maybe put in an audio card instead. So when we're designing the case, uh, we maybe want to factor that in, that the expansion card that we're going to put somewhere down here, uh, we should maybe have kind of a modular design so that we can swap out components in the in the future because we might be doing that. But yeah, let me get the uh, USB card unboxed here. So we have the card itself in an anti-static bank. We have a little uh, power cable, I guess. And a uh, driver CD for Windows, which we don't care about, and a little user manual which we probably also do not uh, care about. So 
So I wonder about the uh, the power cable. I don't know if we need to plug that up to an external power supply or not. Let's just see what the user manual has to say about that. Uh, it doesn't men mention it in the the installation procedure. It says on the, the very back page, make sure to plug four pin power cable on board to provide efficient power to USB devices, but the better way is using device self power to satisfy it. So it sounds like uh, that uh, that power, uh, power cable there is only if, uh, if the PCI, um, the power through the the PCI slot itself isn't able to to uh, satisfy the the devices you're hooking up or something. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, here's the uh, the card. Nothing too fancy here. It's just a, you know, a PCI Express card, uh, X1, and then it's uh, it's got three USB parts on the front and one on the back. And that's really all there is to say about that. So that is the hardware we have acquired. And now it's just a waiting game to get the uh, the adapters so that I can uh, DD the the ext4 file system onto the uh, the SSD, and then we will be in business. So let me uh, put this away here. Okay. So uh, now that we've looked at uh, the hardware that we have, uh, there's one other consideration I want to mention, which is um, with regards to power. Uh, so you can see here, there. Uh, it seems they're not providing extra power to the the USB card. So yeah, I don't believe we need to do anything special to provide extra power to that, even though it has a, a thing for that. Uh, 
But yeah, the other thing to mention is uh, the expansion board actually powers the um, the Hi5 Unleashed itself. So you don't actually need two power cables. Uh, you don't need the power for this one and the power for this one. You just need uh, the power for the expansion board, and that'll power everything else. So uh, that's one of the things I was thinking about with regards to you you know this stuff that we talked about in the past how we're gonna you know handle power stuff uh, I think what we're gonna want to do the simplest design would be to just have the power switch uh, set in the on position uh, for the expansion board and uh, to not worry about the the power for the uh, the hype I've unleashed because the expansion board will power it. So we're just going to run this cable out and uh, you know maybe rather than using the supplied um, the supplied uh, power cable, uh, we can maybe get something else set up. I don't know what our options really are. I'm no electrician, so ideally I don't want to be messing with <laughs> wiring things. Um, but uh, it would be nice to have some kind of thing where we could have like a cable going to like a an outlet and then you can just plug in like a like the kind of socket that you have on a on a power supply unit um, you know just have some kind of like socket here and then you can just plug a usual power supply cable that sort of thing you know and run it to to the uh, wherever you're gonna plug it into but um yeah I don't know exactly what we're gonna do or you know if not that at least some kind of thing some kind of extension that we could have like an extension cable uh, rather than just using the the supplied cable some kind of thing where uh, you know we can have some kind of socket that we can plug this into to extend it Croafa says like an IEC connector uh, I have no idea. I don't know what an I I IEC connector is, <laughs> uh, but I'm guessing you're correct about that. Uh, you know, let me just jot that down as a note. But uh, yeah, something we'll figure out the specifics. But the good thing to know is we just need a cable. Essentially, we just need some way to have, you know, from this point here, you know, cable running out to wherever we're going to plug it into. And ideally, there'd be like a, some kind of socket here that you can plug your cable into. And then something that runs from that socket to the actual, uh, the actual uh, socket here for the the cable to power the board itself uh, that would be the ideal some kind of some kind of extension that we can put in the case right here but if nothing else just a really long cable <laughs> you know rather than the one that's supplied just a really long one uh, if nothing else um, and then the other consideration is uh, like I say for simplicity we can just have the switch stuck in the on position but then uh, we need to press the power button. Uh, and I think rather than having to open up the case to turn the thing on, it would be nice to have some kind of thing rigged up where you have a button up here, you know, but then it, when you press it, it physically will actuate the button here. Uh, the other thing you could do is, you know, maybe like desolder this component and, and you know, wire something up yourself. Uh, or, you know, maybe you don't even need to desolder it. Maybe you can just, you know, wire something off the pins that are exposed. Uh, you know, I have no idea. But um, I'm not, like I say, I, I don't have a background in, uh, you know, doing electronics. And uh, ideally, I'd like to avoid that kind of thing. So... All right, uh, see you later, Risky5. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, so yeah, uh, ideally, it would be nice to have a thing, some kind of some kind of hacky <laughs> rig set up to physically actuate the button, you know, to actually physically press the button when you press a button over here. 
Uh, that's kind of the way I would approach it rather than trying to, to actually wire something up. Uh, and I don't know how we're going to do that yet, but uh, that's the other consideration for power. But it makes it a lot simpler that we don't need two cables. Um, the fact that we only need a cable for this uh, is definitely going to simplify the the power design here. And we're not going to need a power supply either. Uh, thanks to what we see from, from this here, we know that uh, we don't need some kind of external power supply. Uh, everything can be powered just by a cable running to the, the expansion board. And uh, I mean, I guess I still don't know about the specifics of how we're going to have, you know, like if there's something we can do in here within the case itself to uh, kind of make it so we have a socket over here, or if we need to, uh, you know, just have a really long cable. Uh, but if, if we can do something so that there's a socket over here, I don't know if we need some additional hardware uh, to facilitate that, you know, so it's still kind of a question mark, but we're getting a clearer picture of, of what we need for this stuff here. Uh, but yeah, regarding the case, uh, I'm just thinking of when do we want to work in the time to design the, the case in a CAD program? And, uh, you know, the, those kinds of considerations, because I feel like now that we have this stuff going on, I'm going to want to focus on getting software ported so that we can stream from it. But, uh, yeah, the other consideration is actually continuing to work on the, the case too. Um, So we'll maybe try to work in a little bit of both. Um, well, uh, uh, for now, I think I'm just going to say we're going to we're going to wing it by ear, and uh, uh, s just see see how things go. I'm not going to make any definite plans right now, but uh, the other thing that we can maybe consider is how do we want to design kind of a, a modular mounting type of thing to um to facilitate upgrades uh like i say if the if the fpga bitstream can be updated to support the the usb ports that are on the expansion board itself then we would no longer need the usb card and we could get an audio card instead um and if we're gonna do that we need a you know ideally the case should be designed so that that update that that uh card upgrade can be done pretty seamlessly. And this ties into how are we going to mount these cards? Uh, the same applies, to, the same question applies to the graphics card. And uh, what I'm thinking right now is essentially what we should have is something that just fastens to the, um, the bracket. Uh, you know, because that's how it, that's how cards are held in place in a in a like a normal uh, PC build is uh, well. I mean, it's a little bit different because normally they plug directly into the board, right? <laughs> they plug right into the motherboard, but they're kind of like other than the the fact that they're uh, connected to the the motherboard, they're really only secured in place by the the bracket. And it's not like these are heavy cards, you know, with big like heat sinks and fans on them and stuff like that. These are some pretty lightweight, uh, <laughs> you know, cheap pieces of hardware. Uh, I feel like if we just have something to, to, to you know, screw the bracket tight against the case, uh, like the, the wall of the case, um, that would be sufficient to hold it in place. And then, you know, they'll, they'll just be like a expansion cable running from the, the connector to the actual board. Um, so, you know, if we design something to secure a bracket in place, some kind of, uh, 
some kind of rig to secure a bracket in place against the side of the case. Uh, that would in itself be sufficient, I think, uh, as long as we don't design it with the, the dimensions of the bracket in mind, just a generic way to secure uh, to secure it is, is really all we need, potentially. So let's just take a moment to think about that. So, uh, you know, if you set the case down on its side, like let's look at it, um, you know, looking at it kind of from this side, from this side on, but uh, looking at it, um, so like setting the case down like this, basically, you know, um, So like uh, what I'm saying is like this point here in this drawing is this point right here. This point is uh, this point, right? Uh, and in the actual case, we what we would have is, you know, like glass running along here. Here, let me uh, let me draw this diagram in mouse mode, since we have that technology now. We can do straight lines. Okay, so. Just doing a little bit of scribbling here to, to indicate the points again. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's say this is the the glass that's um, uh, the 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 front of the the case. And then essentially what we're going to have is some kind of metal case design where uh, I guess there will just be like some thin, uh, thin rods that go up. Make that thinner. Yeah, whatever. Good enough. Okay, so we have some rods like going up, and then like this area is like the the beefier section of the case where the hardware will actually be, um, you know, hooked up to you. And then, you know, that'll just live pretty close to it down here. So, like, the hardware is in... The hardware is in the space of this dotted line, right? But, um... Basically, what I want is um, so 
some kind of th like it needs to be kept off the back of the case basically it needs to be raised up above the case the the cards so that we don't have like anything shorted um, and it, the cards don't have like mounting points to to do that so that's why I'm uh, considering this stuff so I'm thinking what we're gonna need is like uh, let's say the graphics card lives you know somewhere in here um, yeah so we're probably gonna want hmm I'm just thinking how do we want to make a some kind of enclosure to to just uh, hold the the bracket the metal bracket in place you know so let me take a look at the graphics card. Let's just look at one of these brackets. So the way these these brackets are designed is they have a you know, like a, a tab in the bottom and in the top, it's like a, it makes a 90 degree angle. And um, it kind of has like a, a space to, to put a screw, to screw it in place. So So in terms of adjustability of the card, the main thing that we're going to want is like a thing where the 90 degree angle bit of the, you know, the, the top of the, the bracket, uh, we're going to want a thing to, uh, you know, have, have a spot to screw it tight in place. And then um, the other end, this is the one where we're going to want to have some kind of modular design where uh, because cards will vary in length right so depending on uh, you know normally in a in a PC this end will always be the same you know place but this end uh, can potentially vary like uh, if you were to take this uh, uh, VGA uh, connector out um, they have a separate bracket which is smaller, right? Uh, because you no longer need the bracket to be long enough to have space for this uh, VGA, right? So uh, in that case, the, the lip would be coming out somewhere down here, right? And so the consideration is, well, if we're going to design our case to fix in place based on this, then this end needs to be, or sorry, <laughs> uh, this end needs to, this, needs to be variable uh, because uh, like I say the the length of this could vary and we want to have an upgrade path for our um, our expansion card not not the not the um, the graphics card but the expansion card uh, we're gonna want to upgrade from USB to audio at some point potentially and so I don't want to be fixed in how long this is, right? I want some kind of variability there, but I want some way to secure both ends, of course. So that's the, the design consideration that we're working with. Um, so basically, you know, let's say that we want the card to kind of float in the air Let's just say like this, right? So here's a card just floating around in the air. And so it has a connector over here that makes a 90 degree angle. Uh, in this diagram, it's pointing directly towards us, right? Uh, and so we need some kind of 
thing to to screw that into. So we're going to need some kind of plate. Uh, some kind of plate that's not too thick, but that's secure, that's sturdy and secure. So some kind of uh, some kind of sturdy metal uh, so that we can have like a thin a thin piece that goes up somewhere around here and then uh, you know it just has enough enough room to to screw this thing in basically uh, so yeah, that you can screw it in right here and that'll that'll do the job of holding this thing up and then the other thing is, what are we going to do about this end over here, right? And that's the the trickier bit, because, like I say, we want it to be variable. Uh, so how are we going to do that? Hmm. We might want to figure out like the standard sizes that these brackets can come in and kind of uh, maybe rather than supporting an arbitrary range, uh, you know, just have a few standard mounting options, something like that, uh, that might make the problem simpler. Uh, the other thing is maybe we can create some kind of mechanism to to variably clip this, you know, so if that were the case. Uh, uh, no, we're not really trying to make it ATX-like. Uh, I mean, the design is fundamentally s kind of similar to an ATX case, but we're not trying to have it be strictly an ATX form factor or anything like that. Uh, uh, we were looking at some specifications for... Um, uh, what was this? Uh, I so we were looking at this mini ITX form factor. Uh, it's probably going to be similar dimensions to that. Uh, in terms of uh, form factor, but um, basically we're just going to make it the dimensions to, to fit the hardware that we have, right? Uh, and um, essentially what I'm doing is uh, I'm going to have this glass case, right? And then there's going to be the metal, uh, the metal backing plates where you attach all the hardware. And so here's a view uh, this view right here is like, uh, this is the bottom of the case down here. This is the, the top of the case. And what you're looking at is like you're looking through the glass of the case at the hardware. Uh, so here I've kind of like drawn hardware that's, uh, you know, it's uh, held in place uh, against the case so that you can see all the hardware it's everything's kind of laid out flat so normally a card like this like here's a graphics card right and normally this would be slotted into the PCIe slot at like a, a, a 90 degree angle to the the motherboard uh, but what we're doing is we're laying it out flat so that you can see all the hardware very uh, kind of nicely uh, we're just laying the card out flat, and then we're going to have a cable running to to the actual slot that it needs to slot into. Uh, that's the way we're doing everything. Is we're just the idea is we're just laying everything out flat so you can see it through a glass case. Uh, that's kind of the design that we're going with. And so um, the con the concern here is if we have a card like this, how are we going to uh, keep it uh, mounted above the the case like we don't want it just sitting flat against the um, the metal case uh, 
I mean, I guess we could design part of the case to not be metal, <laughs> to uh, to uh, avoid shorts, something that's like an insulator, but um, and anti-static. <laughs> but uh, I feel like what I want is to just mount it in the air above the case a little bit. And so what I'm thinking about is like the mounting bracket for, you know, like you say, like an ATX case or something like that. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about how that is mounted in a traditional case and thinking how we could rig something up to mount it the way I want in this design we're doing here. That's kind of what I'm uh, uh, thinking about here. So the idea here is this is the glass. This is the, you know, the back of the case where the hardware is attached to. Uh, normally it would be stood up on its side, not uh, laid down like this. But um, my idea is you just have the the card, like the graphics card, floating in the air. And then you have some like little bit of uh, metal that goes up and you can screw, screw it in. Uh, like screw this bit. Uh, into this little metal piece that's sticking out. And then this end, uh, I don't know exactly how you would <laughs> how you would deal with this end. Uh, but uh, my idea is we're gonna use the the ex the existing uh, mounting brackets. We're not going to do like custom mounting brackets or something like that. We're just going to use the, the mounting brackets that come with the cards and uh, you know, figure out a reasonable way to attach those to our to our case like this. So normally uh, this bottom end kind of like fits in snugly uh, in the, the bottom of the case on like a traditional ATX style um, case. But uh, in our case, I'm wondering maybe we could have like a, some kind of like, um, like metal rim that runs along down here and then some kind of thing where you can just clip uh, clip the little tab to the metal rim so it, it clips tightly down here and then it it clips tightly to the 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 card itself and then because it's too it's like a it's like a you know like a metal piece like this and then it just has um, some kind of some kind of clipping mechanism down here and some kind of clipping mechanism up here so this will you know you just slide your here's your card you know and it just clips tight to the card and then down here you have like the metal rim of your case and it just clips tight to that and that kind of holds the thing up in place. Uh, and that's a nice design because then it's uh, totally, you know, uh, uh, expandable, right? Because you can move this clip uh, anywhere you want this way and this way. Granted, you have space in the case that you have, you know, you have lip down here to clip to. Uh, that's really all you need, right? So that might be a, a feasible way to go to design something like this. That seems like it wouldn't be too, too unreasonable, right? I feel like that's something we could do. I'm not going to commit to it yet. I'm not going to say for sure that's how we're going to do it. But uh, yeah, it seems like a reasonable design to me. 
you know the only the only consideration is how are we going to do the clipping mechanism like you know how are we actually going to design that to to work but if we can design a reasonable clipping mechanism and have it be sturdy enough to hold the thing in place well uh you know those are the only design problems and then once you've got that uh, this it seems like the design just on paper it should work right it seems like a, a good way to go so this is you know the current design candidates <laughs> Uh, and yeah, if we decide not to go with that, then uh, we'll need to come up with something else. But we will return to that problem another day and think about it more seriously. But for now, I think we've got a semi-reasonable uh, design idea of how this how this stuff is going to work, right? So uh, I think that's all the design work I want to do for today. I guess the next day, well, I take that back. The other thing we need to figure out is how we're going to manufacture the case. <laughs> if there is, uh, you know, we should just do some market research again to see, uh, you know, is, you know, what are the options out there for uh, designing you know, having a having a case actually be manufactured. Uh, I want it to be metal, so uh, we're not going to be 3D printing, I don't think. And so the question is, are there people out there that are willing to uh, do a, a custom metal PC case design for us? I don't know if there are any people that offer that as like a service that you can you know, purchase or... Uh, if we'd have to like talk to some metal worker, uh, find someone who can do it, or if we're gonna actually have to <laughs> get our hands dirty and do it ourselves. Uh, so, custom metalworking PC case. I don't know if this will turn up any interesting results or not. Now, I feel like aluminum is a potentially a, a good metal to use for this. I don't know how sturdy it is though. Uh, I think commercial cases are often made out of aluminum though, right? I don't know. I don't know a lot about metal. <laughs> uh, I feel like, I don't think cases are made out of sheet metal, are they? Like aluminum sheet metal? Because, uh, you know, my dad has a sheet metal shop. He's a, he's a plumber and he has a, a sheet, sheet metal shop. And uh, from, uh, you know, what I remember from childhood of, of uh, sheet metal, it's like, it's uh, pretty, uh, you know, wobbly, flimsy, right? Uh, Maybe I have a, a wrong impression there, and I don't know if that was aluminum or what kind of actual metal. Uh, maybe I should talk to him some about uh, sheet metal. But uh, okay, well here's a e machine shop metal fabrication custom cut metal. So maybe there are people we can go to for this sort of thing. Metal fabrication, it's generally a uh, subtractive manufacturing process where you cut away or, you know, you remove material uh, until you get the, the desired uh, 
shape, I guess. Okay. Okay, so Karefa says sheet metal is flimsy, but it gets its structure slash rigidity from its bends slash right angles slash supports. Okay, so maybe I shouldn't rule out sheet metal. It seems like uh, what these people are doing here, though, is not uh, sheet metal, though. Oh, well, never mind. They do sheet metal. I take that back. I wonder uh, pricing though. You can get a quote if you give them a design. So okay, so you can give them a CAD file or a drawing, and they'll give you a quote. So uh, we might want to look into this. It would be nice if we could have some just some like ballpark estimates of the kind of cost of a service like this though you know like without even having a specific design i just i kind of want to know what's the the ballpark cost of having a custom you know something of this nature done uh, that would be a nice thing to know so maybe i'll have to contact someone like this and see what they have to say about that. So this machine shop does um, CNC machining, injection molding, 3D printing. But molding and printing That can be metal though, can it? Like, oh, and I've hit my 10 minute warning here. I don't think you can 3D print with uh, <laughs> uh, metal. So I wonder what maybe they do. Okay, yeah, they, they work with plastics and stuff too. But yeah, I want a, I want a metal case. Anyway, like I say, I hit my 10 minute warning, so I guess I'll wrap it up here. Uh, we'll consider case design in another episode, not necessarily the next episode. The ne well, definitely not the next episode. The next episode's going to be a, you know, a Risk V PC in action. That's what the next episode's going to be. Uh, but we'll, we'll get back to this in due time. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in today, and thank you everyone who watches on the YouTube archive, which is available at risky.tv, and you can follow me at hmn underscore risky on Twitter to get updates about the series. Uh, thank you also to everyone who supports me on Patreon. Uh, it really makes the series possible. Uh, and if you would like to use support me on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.risky.tv. I don't have any new shoutouts to give today, but uh, let me take a moment here and read Croefa's latest uh, comment. There is additive printing with metal, but that's pretty cutting edge. NASA actually started experimenting with 3D printing rocket valves. Oh, that is very interesting. I did not know that. That's really that's really cool. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, uh, doesn't apply to what we're going to be doing. We're definitely not going to be uh, on the cutting edge of uh, you know uh, metal printing. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's interesting to know. Thank you for uh, letting us know that. That's cool. And uh, thank you also for the uh, uh, thank you for the streaming. And uh, have a good night as well, Croeva, and everyone else who watches at night. <laughs> if you watch it at night on YouTube. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next episode, and stay risky, everyone.